share some scripture with us? Hello. We're going to be reading from Colossians 1, 3 to 5, 9 to 20, and 20 to 21. We always thank you, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of this body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on blood, uh, things or on earth, or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone, everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all this energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Now we will welcome Mingle to the stage. Thank you, Grace. Y'all give Grace a hand. That was a lot of scripture to read. I've got good news. We are not going to preach through every line that she just read. <laughs> it would take us all day long. In fact, I counted up all the pages of notes that I just um, I, I, I wrote on scratch paper to prepare our message tonight. There's 70 plus pages of notes, but we're only going to use five of them. So it's good news for you as well. Amen. Everybody wants to go home tonight, right? I only have 24 points. Okay. The reason, w the reason why I wanted her to read all of that for you is because um, we're fixing to begin our sermon series through the book of Colossians. But we're going to do such a flyby over Colossians that we're really not going to have a time to go one line at a time. So my encouragement to you is in your personal time and your devotional life that you all have, everyone, that you actually spend some time reading the book of Colossians, maybe in your small groups discussing with small group leaders, maybe. If you're looking for something to teach on for the next four weeks to teach through the book of Colossians, it would be a good time to do it. But what we're going to do tonight is we're just going to take a look at the, what are the big points that Paul is trying to make in Colossians. And from what Grace just read just now, one of the things that we see is that Paul's hope and prayer is that he'd be able to take this little young church in Colossae and he'd be able to disciple them, although he's coming from afar writing a letter, he'd be able to disciple them so that they would be able to live a life worthy of the Lord. And that's what we all want, right? We want to live lives worthy of the Lord. But what Paul says is, the key for living a life worthy of the Lord is that you know God's will. He says, if you, my prayer is that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will so that you will be able to live a life worthy of the Lord. So right now, first off tonight, the first good news that we're going to mention is that it is possible it is possible to live a life worthy of the Lord if you know his will. If you know his will. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to ask this question, how do we know God's will? Is that a relevant question for anyone? Has anyone ever wondered, what is God's will for my life? If, you, if you've never wondered that, you're probably not a Christian, right? And if you've not put your head through a few walls trying to determine what that is, then you're probably not trying hard enough. Amen? We want to know God's will for life, but it's, it sometimes seems one of the most difficult things to do. I remember when I was in college, I was so desperate to know God's will about this particular thing that I, um, I had so much evidence on both sides. Everyone was telling me God is not a God of confusion. 
he makes it really simple and clear. His, his will will always be simple. But I had so much contradicting evidence suggesting I go one way and the other, and I could not do both. So what I did was I got so fed up with it, and I just said, God, I'm not going to eat again until you tell me. I fasted three full days, no eating. Now, that may be not a long time for some of you. You fasted, but for me, I was like, you know, I was a bit chunky. Okay, I wanted to eat, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I like food, all right? I like food. This was, this was different. And this was not unbiblical, by the way. It's actually a very biblical thing that we fast to hear God's will for our life. It's not that if we fast, somehow God will see me starving myself and go, oh, I, I, I feel sorry for this guy. He likes food a lot. I'm going to tell him the answer now. No, it's, you know, God's not like that, hiding behind a cloud, going, ooh, duck angels, there he's looking. No, God wants you to know his will. It is a very biblical thing, though, that we would fast to really put ourselves in a place where we are desperate enough to hear the will of God. Fasting basically says this. Fasting says, God, I care more about knowing the truth than I do eating. Or maybe that's a bit strong. But what it, another way of saying is that, God, your truth for my life is as important as my next breath of air. It's as important as the food I eat. As much as I need food, I don't live on food alone. Amen? Okay. But I got more good news. Fasting three days, starving yourself till God tells you the answer is also not normal. If it were normative, I'd be 30 pounds lighter, and I probably wouldn't be here today. <laughs> because, again, I like food too much, uh, you know. But there is an easier way to know the will of God. And what we're going to do tonight, really briefly, is we're going to find out how do we determine the will of God for our life. Does that sound good to you? Do you want to know the easy way to figure out God's will for your life? Okay, here we go. The first one is really simple. It's this. It's, if you want to know God's will for your life, you've got to know God. That seems, that seems reasonable, right? You want to know God's will for your life, you've got to know God. But maybe, a, maybe you say a, a relevant question is, which God? Which God? Now, I, I don't believe in more than one God, and if someone says, you know, do we worship the same God? The answer, the answer presupposes I believe in more than one God, and that's not true. I only believe in one God. But there's so many different options of what God is like out there that it might be important, and actually it's extremely important for us to determine which God we're talking about. That was true for the people in Colossae. Colossae had a few Christians over here. They had a few more Jews over here. They had a whole lot of Romans, okay? And the whole, whole lot of Romans brought all their, their pagan gods with them. And so, so young people, young in their faith, were fusing all kinds of things, you know, creating basically like a cosmic food truck for, for religion, you know, just trying to come up and to figure out how do we figure out God's will for our life. And Paul gives a much more simple answer than that. And the thing is we just have to get to know God. But which God? And this is supremely important. In fact, A.W. Tozer, anybody know who he is? A.W. Tozer says this. He said, the most important thing about our life, now let me rephrase that. When we think about God, that is the most important thing of our life. What comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Walter Brueggemann says it like this. He says, God is the map whereby we locate the setting of our life. He is the water in which we launch our life raft. He is the real thing from which and toward which we receive our being and identify ourselves. It follows that the kind of God at work in our life will determine the shape and quality and risk at the center of our existence. It matters who God is. So before we get on this business of trying to figure out what God's will is for your life, it's really important to figure out who is God. What is he? As you begin to sit here and mull that over your head and, and process what the first thing that comes to your mind is, I realize that, that can be a very difficult question. It's kind of like asking you what your favorite food is, right? As soon as, soon as, as, soon as somebody says what's your favorite anything, a, you know, a barrage of options starts coming to mind, and before long you're frozen before them, like, I don't know, I don't like food. <laughs> I mean, pizza, dang it, no, right? Okay, I know this is difficult, so what I've done is I've prepared a little exercise to help you out, Okay. What we're going to do here, and this only really works if you really dive in and, and say the first absurd thing that comes to your mind, okay? I'm going to show you a couple images. I'm going to show you a couple images, and whatever, the, and whatever the first thing that comes to your mind is, I want you to turn to the person next to you and just say it, okay? Are you ready? Is everybody ready? In the back, are you ready? Ben Tour, are you ready? Okay, ready? First image, first image, go. Well, not the name of the college. What do you think about Wise? Okay, okay, calm down, calm down, calm down. Shh. You got the idea now. It's not the name of the cause we're looking for, okay? Next one, next one. Yeah. 
I heard not at college right off the bat. Okay, calm down, calm down. One more, one more. Ready? Let's see what he did. Okay, okay. Enough fun, enough fun. You got the, you got the, you got the, you got the hang of the game now, right? Enough fun. Let's talk about God. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about God? For Paul, it's Jesus. In that first chapter, um, that piece that Grace read, he actually, he's actually citing a, an early Christian poem that goes like this. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. But God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The first thing that comes to Paul's mind when he thinks about God is Jesus. You see, that poem right there isn't describing Jesus. If you look at all those attributes, those are all attributes that people knew were reserved for God. And what Paul is saying is, if you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, you look into the eyes of Jesus. One of my favorite theologians, John Wayne, said, life is hard. It's even harder if you're stupid. <laughs> of course, I would never say that without a trigger warning. <laughs> but, but what I might say to also help me keep my job would be something like this. Life is hard. It's hard to live a holy life. It's hard to be selfless. It's hard to know the will of God. But it's even harder if you don't know what God is like. And what Paul is saying is, it's Jesus. Paul is saying is, if you're looking for the answers to the longings of your heart, you look to Jesus. Because in the words of E. Stanley Jones, the greatest thing this world ever learned is that God is just like Jesus. And if you want to know the will of God, if you want to know the will of God, then you must get to know God. If you want to get to know God, you can go straight to Jesus. Before we move to the second point, I want to give a little bit of a, a caveat. Is that right? For many of us growing up in a Christian family, in a Christian tradition, we have a tendency to kind of um, accept the person of Jesus that we were passed down, right? But the reality is, is that Jesus is alive. Like all living people, you've never plumbed the depths of all there is to get to know about him. What we want to do is we want to take a picture of Jesus and we want to worship this picture, but Jesus is alive. So if you want to get to know Jesus, you've got to get rid of the still phone, and you've got to dive in every season of your life and get to know Jesus all over again. I read the Gospels every semester so I can continue to see Jesus with fresh eyes. This is my challenge to you. If you want to know the will of God for your life, you must get to know Jesus with fresh eyes. Amen? The second thing, the second step to getting to know the will of God for your life is you have to actually want to know God's will for your life and not the other way around. Does everybody have a favorite verse? Like you quote to yourself, like when you're anxious or when you're scared, you have those, right? My favorite one when I'm scared is second, uh, Timothy 2, seven. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> oh, man, I used to say it to myself all the time. Uh, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You have those kinds of verses, right? Does anyone have a favorite verse for does everyone have their favorite verse to misquote, though? <laughs> Other than me, because I clearly don't know the reference there. Sad pastor. Um, actually, I do have a favorite one to misquote, though. It comes from Jeremiah 29, 11. Many of you are probably familiar with this one. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Now, I absolutely love this verse, because the Hebrew word that we translate for plans here could also be translated to say the word dreams. And I love the idea that God has dreams about my life. I love the fact that God has dreams about what I could be if I ever learned to walk with him. That gives me so much 
dignity. But there's two kinds of people in this world. There are those who divide the world into two kinds of people and those who do not. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> there are two kinds of Christians in this world, though. There are those who read that verse and they hear this, the shorthand version, okay? They read that verse and they hear this, God has great plans for my life, right? And there are those who read that verse and they hear this, God has a great life for my plans. It's a very subtle difference, but it's very profound. I'll leave it up to you to figure out which one I prefer, okay? But if we want to get to know the will of God for our life, we have to be willing to surrender our plans for his. Amen. Are you with me? Okay, I'm, at, at the risk of belaboring this, I'm going to go into a little bit of a thought experiment here. Because I think this is probably the most important thing for us. If there's one thing that keeps us from figuring out God's will for our life, it's that we don't actually want to know his will, but have him know ours. So I want you to imagine two students graduating from high school, okay? They're going off into college. And uh, one, is, one student is a follower of Jesus, the other one is not. They both come and they go, they're thinking about what they're going to get a degree in. The, the student who doesn't yet follow Jesus, he says, can I study anything I want? Can I be anything I want when I grow up? And the answer is, absolutely. I am the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. So you know what he does? Whatever he wants. But the follower of Jesus, he asks the same question. Or she. Asks the same question. Can I do anything I want? Can I study anything I want? Can I do anything I want when I grow up? <coughs> and he or she says, no, of course not. Jesus is the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. I need to run it by Jesus first. So we come to Jesus with a prayer that sounds something like this. Whether you've ever vocalized this prayer to Jesus or not, you've at least thought of it in some form or fashion. We come to Jesus like this. Jesus, can I be a doctor for your kingdom? Doctor, Jesus, can I be a teacher for your kingdom? Can I be a lawyer? Can I be an engineer? Can I be a banker for your kingdom? And that's not a bad question, right? It's, it's, it's not a bad question. At least you're asking the question. The kid who doesn't yet follow Jesus, he's not asking it at all, right? But it's not a great question. And here's a little trick in life. If you want good, an if you want good answers, you've got to ask good questions, okay? And this is why it's not a great question. Asking God if he can do, if asking God if he can use your degree somehow to advance his kingdom on the earth. It's kind of like asking, hey, God, can you do anything you want? It's a non-starter. The answer is unequivocally yes. God can do anything he wants. He's God, right? He can do anything he wants. And so what ends up happening is they don't hear no, but they don't hear yes either because they can imagine somehow using their degree for God and his kingdom, you know what they do? The same thing the first kid did, whatever they want. It's a bit like going into a, an interview with God and saying, hey, God, here's my resume. Uh, on it are some things that uh, you put in me when I was born, some of the things I picked up from my family, some things I picked up from Rice, but, but uh, I've got my passions on there. I've got, I've got the, the kind of career I'd like to have written right on there. Um, I'm really just trying to figure out between firm A and firm B, so because you are the master of my fate and the captain of my soul, I submit it to you. Now, it's a, it's a better question than not asking at all. And it's covered up in evangelical terminology. But it's a bit presumptuous, wouldn't you say? Rather, the kid who is resolved to actually know God's will for their life comes into that meeting and he says, hey, God, here's my resume. If you need to refer to it, it's over here. But here am I. What would you have me do? Where would you have me serve? Where is there not enough love in the world? Where is evil mocking the victory of Jesus on the cross in the first century? God, what breaks your heart? And what can I do? Have I anything to offer? Or can you just use me? You make that prayer prayer of your heart, 
and the will of God will be extremely hard to meet. In fact, I bet every time you turn the corner, the will of God will be shouting you down. You'll have to ask God to silence his voice where you can sleep at night. Because God wants for his kingdom to grow on this earth ten times more than every one of us even thought. The will of God is not hard to have when you ask for right intentions. And that's my answer for you. If you want to know the will of God for your life, you actually you actually have to want it. Step number three, and this is it. And we're almost really going to close with it. <clears throat> if you want to know the will of God for your life, you have to be willing, you have to be, you have to be willing to do it. That sounds so simple, right? You must obey. If you want God to tell you his will for your life, he's not going to tell you. There's no promise that God will tell you his will for your life if you just want to consider it. You understand what I'm saying? It doesn't matter what kind of evangelical terminology you cover it up with. God sees your heart. But if you really want to know the will of God for your life, I bet he speaks it to you when you least expect it. I think the best example of this is probably, again, Mother Teresa. Do you remember her story? Do you remember her story? She was on a train when she was 36 on the way to a spiritual retreat called LTC. I know you guys think I'm crazy, but she really was 36. And I was at the LTC retreat, so I can confirm. <clears throat> and she was on that train, and she, she had a mystical vision. She had a mystical vision. We don't have those at Rice, but, but she had a mystical vision from heaven, God revealing his will for her life. And what, what she saw was Jesus looking down from the cross at her. And he spoke to her, giving her four, four instructions, four things he wanted her to do for him. The first one was, I want you to go to the poorest of the poor. I want to go to the poorest of the poor, yet I have no one to take me. I want you to take me to the poorest of the poor. Number two is, I want you to go to them. I don't want you to bring them out. I want the blessing that comes to them to transform the community. So I want you to go to them. Number three, she said, I want you to raise up workers, nuns from within the community. I want these people to learn how to be the hands and feet of Jesus for their own people. And number four, I only want you to go to those to whom have absolutely no one else to turn. And you remember what she did. She went to Calcutta. She opened a hospice called the Home for the Dying. And the criteria was pretty simple. Um, you had to be dying to get in. Um, and you had to have absolutely no one else who could take care of you. She wouldn't negate anyone's responsibility to take care of her own. But if you fit that simple criterion, she would come by in her little box-shaped ambulance. And she would get out and she would pick your body up off the streets. She would take you to the home, her home. She would bathe your body. She would, she would cleanse your sores and your wounds. And she would nurse you and feed you until it was your turn to go be with God. And when she was asked, why do you do these things? She said, because I believe everyone has the right to die in the presence of a loving God. And then Mother Teresa's career in Calcutta, she picked up over 42,000 dying people off the streets. She brought them into her, her own home, and every one of them died in the presence of a loving face, the face of Jesus, shining through Teresa. And that's a beautiful story, right? And I know what you're wondering. I know, I know what the question you're asking in your heart right now. Didn't he tell us this story five months ago? That's a fair question. The answer is yes, I did. It's a hard life being a preacher. <laughs> you have to come up with stories every week. But in all seriousness, the reason why I ask you that question is because who doesn't want God to speak to them that clear? Which of you right now wants God to speak to you so clear as he did Teresa? Show me your hand. Do you want to know the will of God that clear? Raise your hand. How many of you are ready to go to Calcutta to die? How many of you are ready to give up your careers, your plans, and your dreams to go live without recognition 
and in, and in obscurity all the rest of your days. Me not. It's not what I want to do. And therein lies the rub. If we want to know the will of God for our lives, we must know Jesus. And we must be willing, we must be willing to actually know his will for our lives. And we must be willing to obey wherever he sends us. We must be willing to obey and to follow Jesus wherever he leads. These are the conditions. They're not conditions for salvation, but they are conditions for you to know the will of God for your life. Now, there's a 95% chance he's not going to call any of you to India. And yes, I absolutely made that statistic up on the spot. (laughs) But what an adventure it would be to get to the end of your life and look back and know that every day was spent in the will of God making something beautiful with it. What an adventure it would be. You know what these three things boil down to? Simply this, taking God as serious as you want him to take you. And when you do, when you begin to take God as serious as you want him to take you, Seriously, no. But when you do this, you will be able to live a life worthy of the Lord. You will know the will of God for your life. And you and I, as a family, will be a city on a hill, the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And God's kingdom will come to bear on this campus as now. not in any sermon.